We're going to talk about a number of things. We'll cover a little bit on the hype and reality of AI. Uh, things have changed an awful lot since this sort of burst on the scene for us in uh, late 2017-18. We'll do a little bit on terminology and background, not that much, and a little bit on strengths and limitations. We will spend a fair amount of time on the impact of artificial intelligence in a number of areas of the imaging enterprise. Uh, but when we get down to the actual images themselves, we'll talk about quantitative imaging uh, and triage. We won't be covering image reconstruction in this talk, but we will be um, later on in the meeting. So what is AI? AI is essentially a, a, um, a process where computers do things that are ordinarily associated with human intelligence. As you can see, uh, there's an awful lot of interest and funding going on in AI in the healthcare enterprise. The big uh, OEMs are the ones filing the, the most patents. And you can see between big data analytics and you know AI itself, you can see that this is really key technology that is impacting healthcare. As a matter of fact, back in 2018, about half the healthcare organizations were already either using AI or actively planning to use AI. Now we know this stuff's all around us and you know everything that we do. You know, you, you can't avoid being tracked, you know, uh, with ads. I, I I buy Wagyu beef and every time I open a website, you know, there's another special that I get to see. You see this stuff everywhere. So it's ubiquitous um and um you know, pretty impressive. You know, we're all familiar with, uh, you know, beating experts at Go and, and chess. And to us, this seems very, very impressive. But in reality, games are actually very easy for computers to win. It's really not that hard. It's actually sort of low hanging fruit for them. Um, we know that uh, computer vision is behind uh, autonomous driving. We know now, by the way, that it, uh, computers are better at image recognition than humans, and they're better at speech recognition than humans. So things have really come quite some way. Um, this is, you know, essentially a tool that, or a process that enables machines to sense, comprehend, act, and learn. Um, you know, to some folks, it's been referred to, it's referred to as the new electricity. All right. Pretty, um, pretty good hype. Well, you know, are there any warts behind the scenes? Well, we do know that these autonomous driving systems are not flawless, um, and they occasionally fail, you know, and like autopilot almost did, uh, you know, when Sully brought this plane down, you know, in the, in the water just outside my apartment in Manhattan. So we're going to talk a little bit about ultra high field and there's probably no, no area of MR that I think is, lends itself more to AI applications. And as you'll see, because these magnets have the ability to acquire it at such high resolution. That's really what AI requires. It, the less ambiguity the data has that you feed it, the better analyses it can perform for us. So I'll point out various areas as we move along where I think AI is beginning to make some uh, inroads uh, in other areas, but they'll very soon be extended to high field. So the goal today is to familiarize you with the relative advantages and challenges of high field MR, and there are significant ones that we need to be aware of, but none that I think are insurmountable, and many of which I think you will agree have already been surmounted very satisfactorily. We want to examine various applications of uh, high field MR imaging, including anatomic in physiologic imaging, and that's really one of the exciting areas. We're just going beyond anatomy, which is exciting in itself, but now really beginning to spread out those spectra in MRS, et cetera. So these are the topics that we'll cover. We're gonna define what ultra high field means. We're gonna look at some hardware applications and enhancements, advantages of ultra high field. We're gonna look at some examples of anatomic imaging, functional MRI at ultra high field with an emphasis on bold imaging. We'll look at cerebral vascular reactivity and its impact on bold. And that's really kind of a new and exciting area that I think uh, you'll find very interesting. We'll look a little bit at, at sodium imaging, a little bit of the basics, resting state networks, look at microvascular MRA, which is another very interesting area, uh, particularly for the vasculitides, lupus, uh, cerebral vasculitis, et cetera. MR spectroscopy, oxygen 17, and MR PET systems, and we'll conclude with just a couple of brief statements. So ultra high field is any scanner that is operating at 7T or above. And now there's talk of even scanners operating at 9, 11, and maybe even 14. Currently, there are over 90 installed systems worldwide. This is work by uh, Cosotini, who did a survey, and Fagan as well. This is data that just appeared this past year. Uh, all of these scanners are able to provide multi-parametric MR, very high resolution structural MR imaging, beautiful functional techniques, and fast and ultra-fast imaging, which opens up some exciting avenues as well for temporal analysis of uh, physiologic changes in the body.
hardware developments. There's really been a lot going on by way of ultra high field MR uh, it, with novel coil developments and techniques that specifically focus on the homogenization of the transmit field because that's really where the challenges come in. These are very short wavelengths of the signals and you really need these multi-array channels to, for transmit and receive to kind of limit that B1 homogeneity that's kind of the hallmark of these higher field magnets. And that's because there's really an accentuation of dielectric effects at those higher fields and that's of concern. Multiple channel receiver coils for parallel imaging, uh, algorithms for higher order B1 shimming, and these are all things that really require an outstanding technical team. These machines are like high performance Ferraris. They, you can't just run them, you've got to tune them. And you've got to tune them every day and make sure that they're running properly. You really need to improve that homogeneity every time that patient gets into the scanner. High field amplification of susceptibly weighted imaging to take advantage of that enhanced susceptibly weighted imaging. It can be a liability or it could be an advantage. Novel patch antenna designs for acceptable transmit homogeneity as well. And then images with high speed resolution and high SNR is the ultimate result. Uh, we're going to shift gears here now and go back to the neuro component of our, our course. Looking this morning at uh, a way to approach head and neck uh, pathology, similar to what we did with cranial nerves, taking a systematic approach, an anatomically based approach to help us refine our ability to form a differential diagnosis. We'll talk a little bit about different modalities as well as we uh, proceed. Now, in head and neck, it really encompasses a number of areas. We could really dedicate separate lectures or even sections of this course to skull base imaging, cervical soft tissues, which we're going to focus on this morning, the temporal bone, the sinonasal cavity, and even the orbit. So these are all components. We'll see, we'll see some images that reflect all of these areas, but we'll focus today on basically categorizing pathology in the supra and infrahyoid neck. There are a number of disease categories, just like when we see intracranial pathology that we consider, and we form a similar differential diagnosis when we encounter something in the head and neck. Obviously, most of the time when we think head and neck imaging, we're thinking of tumor, but there are other c categories of disease to consider. Infection, congenital anomalies, uh, vascular, post-traumatic, etc. So. We have to keep in mind there is a differential diagnosis. What's going on here? I don't think I would ever make this diagnosis, uh, but we can we can describe it. We can describe where it is. You can see the secondary effects of obstruction of the eustachian tube in the nasopharynx, and this turned out to be nasopharyngeal amyloid. So we don't need to make a pathologic diagnosis every time. When some rare zebras occur, we may not make it at all, but it might not be in our differential. But important to be familiar with the anatomy and to bear in mind when you're forming a differential diagnosis, think of all disease categories. Which modality do we use, CT or MR? It turns out CT is very effective at head and neck imaging, more so than in the brain, where obviously we typically always will prefer uh, MR except in the traumatic setting. But CT does a great job as long as the patient isn't too cachectic. We have a great contrast, intrinsic contrast uh, media, fat, that helps us distinguish uh, soft tissues uh, from one another. And uh, bone is great. Evaluation of bone is fabulous. The, the contrast resolution MR for soft tissues, however, is the obvious advantage that we like in the brain. It's the same in the neck. But CT gives us an excellent visualization of things that we don't worry about as much in the brain. We can distinguish calcifications from other causes that would be on MR be a signal void. We can very well evaluate the cortical bone. Obviously, marrow uh, pathology is much better evaluated on MR. It's easy to see nodal necrosis, etc. And it's very rapid. Even our fast scanning that uh, Dr. Rofsky just revealed doesn't get close to what we can do in, a, in, a, in the acute setting uh, with CT because we can rapidly image. Or many of these patients have difficulty with swallowing, controlling that, et cetera, the coughing. CT is not as sensitive.